The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to, the, to today's webinar, Annual Meeting, Budget Vote, and Board Election. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here at New York ASBO, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, with us on the webinar are Daniel Pettigrew and Allison Smith from Thomas Trohan, Waxman, Pettigrew, and Maley. We also have on the line uh, Deborah Brosen, who uh, helped set up this topic for you. Before we get to the actual webinar content, there's a few points I'd like to let you know about. If you have a question at any time, there's two different ways you can uh, get that question answered. Uh, one is the chat window, and the other is the questions window. You will find both of those on your GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. If you don't see that control panel, but you do see a small orange box with an arrow on it, click that orange box. It will maximize your control panel, and then you'll see either the questions or the chat window. The chat window, everyone will see uh, your question. Uh, if you use the question window, that goes directly to me. I'll then break in and ask our presenters the question for you. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can respond right in that window uh, once uh, Daniel and Allison answer the question. With well, that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Daniel and uh, Allison. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I thought it's probably an appropriate uh, topic that we discuss annual meetings and district votes, uh, not simply because uh, it's, it's just around the corner, but more practically speaking, I think we're all sick and tired of the wonderful weather we've had. So knowing that the budget vote, the annual meeting election is going to be in spring, spring is certainly around the corner. Anyway, um, what Alice and I are going to talk about we, in terms of our uh, how we structured this we into three sets or you know three kind of categories the pre-vote worries election day conundrums and post-vote quandaries uh, for pre-vote worries we discussed the legal notice uh, what you do with the uh, what are the requirements uh, as far as publication timing how many uh, board and voter initiated propositions uh, you know what are the rules and regulations regarding that uh, candidate petitions, expenditure statements, and, and ballot placement, absentee ballot procedures, and improper advocacy. With regard to legal notice, I think uh, most of you, or I'm sure most of you know that uh, the requirement is at least four times in seven weeks preceding the annual meeting uh, that <clears throat> you're required to publish notice for the current 2015 budget vote. That would mean your initial notice would have to go out um, anywhere from March 31st to April 4th because the first day that you could publish notice is seven weeks but you have to have it at least 45 days so that's really your window for your first legal notice and then you publish uh, three more times during the remaining uh, period. As far as um, deadline for uh, filing candidate petitions again if you are a Union Free Central School District uh, it's a 30-day requirement. Uh, that means uh, it would fall on this year, Monday, April 20th, uh, which is, I believe, 29 days before the election. Uh, so people might say, well, wait a second, you, it has to be 30. Well, that, what about uh, Sunday or why not Friday? Uh, why not Friday? Because that's more than 30 days. Under uh, New York State, statutes and how, uh, how they're constructed. There's a provision that says if a deadline falls on a weekend, by law it goes to the next business day. So therefore, uh, since the 30 days would be on Sunday, by law the last day to file uh, candidate petitions would be Monday, April 20th. Um, for small city school districts, it's a little bit different. There's a special requirement for uh, 20 days uh, filed, which I believe is uh, April 29th. Um, a little bit about personal registration. Uh, you know that I'm sure most of you have, uh, you know, county board of elections. Uh, you get the whole voter list, but there are those there are those sort of uh, special provisions in the education law that allow people who just want to vote in school district elections to register personally. And there's slight, slight discrepancies or, uh, or differences, if you will, between the personal registration requirements for a union-free and central school district as opposed to a small city school district. 
in a union free and central school district, um, the board of registration, uh, which is appointed by the board of education, uh, they set are supposed to set a day um, when they meet. Uh, the last day, which can't be more than five uh, days before uh, the vote. Um, at small city school districts are different in that the last day to register cannot be less than 14 days before the vote. So a little bit of a difference there. Um, as far as the uh, and and the small city school districts also have a special requirement uh, in which the, that personal registration uh, is available, and the notice of registration must be published at least once in each of the two weeks before the first registration date. So. Uh, the question is, can you just have one day? Could the first day of registration in a small city school district be the last day of, a, uh, of registration in a small city school district? The, the answer is yes. So if the board fixed a registration date in a small city school district as being 14 days, that's, it's going to be one day that the board of registration would meet, it would be 14 days before, then the notice of registration would have to go out 21 days before the vote and 28 days before the vote, and that would that would satisfy uh, that requirement. As far as uh, absentee ballot application deadlines, this is another thing that must be specified in the legal notice, uh, besides the deadline and the registration requirements. Um, if you are going to, this is consistent whether you are a union-free central or a small city school district. And if a, a person is going to be absent from the uh, from the school district in the uh, on the day of the election, if they want their ballot mailed, their application has to be in seven days before the vote. If the absentee, if the voter is going to wants to come in personally and pick up their ballot, their application must be uh, made one day before the vote. Uh, turning to the issue of propositions, and when I'm saying these are propositions other than the required school district budget proposition, um, there are slight differences uh, between what happens if a board is going to put up a prop, it's a, a, an additional proposition that requires expenditures of funds, or if the voters are going to do it. If the board uh, initiates a proposition and it's going to require uh, the expenditure of funds. So, for example, a vote on a bond proposition, a vote uh, for you know whether that be uh, to raise uh, money to, to issue bonds to build a capital improvement or to buy buses, or some other. Let's say that a board doesn't is going to seek to build a addition or some renovation project that they're not going to go out for bonds, but they're going to be specifically spending money. Then the proposition language must be included in the legal notice, and it must be in at least submitted 45 days before the election, or I should say voted on by the board to put it up so that the district clerk will be able to publish legal notice with the initial notice of the budget hearing. So if the board decides to put up a capital project after the fact, that that's a problem uh, that would not comply with the law. For voter-initiated pr propositions, it's a little bit uh, different. It depends. Um, the bo most boards are required by uh, have either by policy or it's actually a requirement in the law to prescribe when a proposition will have to be uh, filed by voters in order for the board to put it up. Uh, many have like a thir many have a sort of like a 30-day notice. Some have a 60-day notice. But the most important thing that you have to realize as a district clerk is that if the proposition has to be in the legal notice, i.e., it's going to require an expenditure of funds, then that proposition will have to be in at least 45 days before the election. Um, obviously, if the policy says that capital project propositions, we want 
to vote on a, on a new athletic field. We, the community, feel that we, we want the latest and the greatest for our students. So we want you to put up a proposition to and construct an a artificial turf field. Uh, you'll have to, and here's what it will cost. Um, they'll be required to comply. They will have to have it in uh, in enough time for the board to advertise it in the legal notice. Uh, so, and they and they be required to comply with the bylaw. Um, what happens with voter initiated propositions that are uh, that might not be within their powers? Uh, so, for example, a Let's say uh, the voters want the, vo uh, the board to put up a proposition to, for example, remove all residential property from the tax roll. I mean, I think that's something that everybody would like to do, uh, but no, that's not something that the voters have any authority to do. So um, there, here are some ca a couple of cases uh, that I have here where if the power is not within the voters, uh, to vote on, then the board uh, may reject the proposition. So what happens then if uh, the voters want to put, ask the board to put up a straw poll, uh, just an advisory opinion, just to, to get an idea, well, well, should we do this thing? We're, we're not certain that we really want it, but we just want to take kind of a, a, a straw poll. Again, if, it's, if a proposition asks simply for an advisory opinion, uh, it can be, uh, it may be rejected by the board. Um, the board also has, however, the flexibility that if the voters feel very strongly about a particular topic and, and the board is sensitive to that, and the language in the voter-initiated proposition is not, uh, doesn't have all the required elements. So, for example, it doesn't have the requisite amount of money uh, that the board would be required to uh, expend on it. The board could, in its discretion, revise the language of a proposition, uh, and in order to bring that to bring that proposition into conformity with the law. Uh, again, that's a may revise it. They're not required to. So discretion is really within the board on what to do with uh, voter-initiated propositions. Uh, it, and whether they're going to, uh, to have the community vote on it. Moving on to uh, candidate petitions. Uh, so it's always, uh, <clears throat> again, how many signatures will a candidate be required uh, to obtain uh, in order to put their name on the ballot? Uh, under New York law, uh, if you're in a union free and central school district, um, you are required at a minimum to obtain 25 signatures or 2% of those the number of individuals who presented themselves to vote in the last annual election. Um, and whichever number is greater. Uh, so then the question comes up, well, how do we know who voted in the last election? Do we just tabulate? the numbers of individuals who voted on the budget? Do we simply vote the number of individuals who uh, voted for candidates? Uh, the answer to either of those would be neither. Uh, what you would need to look at is who actually uh, presented themselves to vote in person. Uh, and again, as, as a district clerk, um, the election inspectors are supposed to, uh, you, you have a, a, a number of people who come, sign their, their voter card, uh, and you look at the poll list, see how many people presented them phys themselves physically to vote, uh, whether by affidavit ballot or in the machines, plus those people who actually submitted absentee ballots. That's the number on which you, ba on which you base the 2% figure. And the two percent is those people. It's again, it's the, the number you use is last year's annual election. You do not use uh, the numbers who present themselves at a subsequent budget vote uh, if the uh, 
budget vote is a second budget vote. You don't look at that number. You, only, you look at those people who came to the annual meeting the year before. Um, in the small city school districts, uh, you require a minimum of 100 qualified voters in order to be, to, to be nominated and have your name placed on the ballot. The deadlines, again, slightly different, 30 days for Union Free small, uh, Central and 20 days uh, before the election in a small city school district. Uh, question, this question uh, at the bottom uh, of this slide frequently comes up. What, well, what happens if a candidate withdraws, dies, or becomes somewhat ineligible uh, for whatever reason to run, let's say they move out of the, they're no longer a resident, uh, before, less than 15 days before the deadline. Uh, under the education law, the deadline is required to be extended for another 15 days provided no less than seven days before the vote. And when we talk about, in a, in a, in a future slide uh, that we have on placement of candidate ballots, I just want you to remember that uh, scenario because that does, uh, that does create some rather interesting results. Uh, as far as the expenditure statements for, uh, for candidates, um, they must, uh, how, much, how many must they file? Uh, education law requires three candidate expenditure statements to be filed. Uh, the deadlines are 30 days before the election, which interestingly enough is the same day on which the petitions are due. So uh, if you submit your petition, if you're a candidate, you submit your petition on April 20th this year, you're also going to have to supply a candidate expenditure statement. Five days before the election is the second statement deadline and then 20 days after the election. Uh, the expenditure statements um, are filed with the district clerk uh, unless the amount of money the candidate that has been raised by the candidate for an expended uh, either directly or on their behalf, in which case you must then file uh, the statement with the, not only the district clerk but also the commissioner of education. And um, there was a recent change in uh, within the last 10 years, a uh, change in the law that if a candidate receives a thousand dollar contribution or loan after the close of one of the filing periods, the, th uh, the fi three filing periods I mentioned above they must file a special expenditure statement within 24 hours of the, of the close of the filing period. Um, so as the district clerk, the uh, question would frequently arise, so what happens if I don't get my expenditure statements? Uh, do, I, am I, do I have the power of the police? I could go out and find these candidates and put them in jail? No, uh, you don't have that authority as the district clerk. Um, what has to, the only if the only per way a campaign expenditure statement can be a uh, requirement can be enforced is if another candidate commences legal action in state supreme court to enforce the requirement. And what uh, and you should note that there are commissioner decisions uh, that have held specifically that failure to file a expenditure statement is not the basis to set aside the results. But so uh, I think that's pretty much all on expenditure statements. As far as ballots place, what, what's it now we're either at, all, at April 20th or April, uh, if you're a union free central school district clerk. And we have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Joanne would like to know, would small city schools submit expenditure statements 20 days before as that is the deadline for small city schools? Is that a deadline for small city schools? Yes. Same deadlines apply for union free, central, and small city school districts with respect to the filing of campaign expenditure statements. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Candidate ballot placements. Uh, what, how is the order determined? Uh, the education law specifies a lot drawing that takes 
that is supposed to take place the day after uh, petitions are due. Uh, names are, of all candidates are arranged by drawing lots uh, with the direction that as many candidates may be voted for as there are vacancies to be filled. Uh, if, there, if you are a school district, and I don't know how many are out there, uh, maybe, we'll, maybe somebody will ask this question, but if you are a school district that, that is not at large, you don't have at large voting, rather you have specific, separate specific offices, then you would be required to group the drawing of lot by the specific vacancy that's coming up, uh, the specific office. Uh, so if there are three different offices and in the first one there's just one candidate running, but in the second one there are four candidates, and in the third one there are two, um, well obviously the one candidate just when uh, you know they'll 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 go on first with the second seat. If there are four candidates, there'd be a specific drawing of for the, those four candidates and how they'll be placed on the ballot. And the last seat would have a drawing of two: who would be first, who would be placed first, and then who would be placed second. Uh, the education law also requires for us many offices that are being uh, voted on. You must have a one blank space under the name of the last candidate for each specific office to have write-in. So if you are, if you have five candidates running for office, um, in the ballot you will need five separate blank spaces because legally an individual uh, qualified voter coming to vote could say, I don't want to vote for any one of the five ones who spent their time submitting uh, petitions, getting, gathering signatures, and filing their expenditure statements, I'm going to vote for whoever I want to vote for. And they have the right to do that. So the ballot, though, has to make sure that there's a corresponding blank space for, a, for each office uh, that is being uh, voted on. As, and if you recall, I had mentioned earlier what happens if a candidate withdraws dies or is otherwise is ineligible for the office uh, at least 15 days before the deadline to, uh, to vote, uh, to, to file your petition, that extends the deadline. What happens if um, there's a change after the first drawing of the ballots? Uh, the education law states that you would actually have to have a redrawing of ballots. Uh, and I don't know if that's ever happened uh, in, in any of your districts. Uh, it actually happened in one of my clients where somebody was, who was in the first round or the first drawing uh, was placed first. Uh, there was a ineligibility and then it was redrawn and then he was placed last of seven candidates, uh, the second go around. And so, yeah, you know, that's a, yes. We have two questions actually. First question, uh, how do the machines count the write-in candidates? How do the machines write in? They, they, there should be a uh, uh, place on the. Are we talking about le if we're talking about lever machines? There should be a location on the bottom uh, where you can write in a candidate, and the machine should uh, that that should spit out uh, at the conclusion uh, just the write-in part. There, there will be no listing. There, there would be no count. Uh, if you just press the lever for one of the candidates showing, so it would that's how it would recognize that. And I believe for the Scantron ballots, uh, there's specifically a write-in name, so it, the ballot would read that as well. Uh, it, it, the machine would read that. It, it would be clear there would be no um, corresponding vote mark for any of the listed candidates, and you would see a specific. Uh, name of a write-in, and that would be a write-in. Okay, second question. What if you don't vote on seats, but the election is at large? If you, um, and I think this question, if, it's, if this question is specifically address, addresses the drawing of lots, uh, if you don't vote specific seats, uh, everybody's name is in the ring. Uh, so. If there are 
three seats up and eight candidates, uh, and it's an at-large district. Uh, all eight names would be placed in the hat, so to speak, and the lots, uh, the, their names would be drawn out, and they would, as they are drawn out, that would be the order, one through eight. Okay. And a follow-up, if there are two seats open, how many blank spaces should be on the ballot? Two. One for each of the, uh, one. if there are two, if there are two, let me just, uh, let me end this, if there are two separate seats, if there are only two seats up for election, there must be a blank space uh, for each of those offices, so a total of two. All right, simple enough, that's it, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to absentee ballots. Uh, there are very specific requirements uh, that, that are listed here, and it has to, in order to be eligible to vote. Illness or disability, that's one category. Hospitalization, incarceration, travel outside the voter's county or city of residence. Uh, for employment or business reasons, studies or vacation on the day of the election. Uh, those are individuals who uh, have to submit applications in order, and that's how their eligibility will be determined. And on the application itself, they would have to uh, attest to the fact that they fall into one of those categories. If a voter is marked permanently disabled, uh, then that individual automatically gets an absentee ballot. And as far as what the district clerk's responsibility is, uh, once the absentee ballots are issued, they must record the name of the voter uh, to whom the ballot was issued on a list of absentee ballots. And as you will see later, uh, there's a very specific reason why uh, their names have to be uh, accused. Uh, accumulated on a list if you get an absentee ballot. There are s some special rules for nursing homes or other adult care facilities. If, um, if, the, if the county or a city board of elections has 25 or more absentee ballot applications from a nursing home, then the board of elections is required to send election inspectors between 1 and 13 days before the election to supervise the completion of the absentee ballots by the residents of that facility. Uh, note that under uh, current election law and education law, it, the school district has no authority to supervise that voting. That is the responsibility of your local county or city board of elections. Uh, it, so if you are a district that has happens to have nursing homes within your ge geographic boundaries, uh, kind of, that's like a checklist, you, you, you'd kind of check off making sure that the Board of Elections will be sending designated individuals into those uh, nursing homes in order to obtain uh, the completion of absentee ballots. Personal caregivers uh, are entitled to an absentee ballot if they cannot appear at, during the election because of duties related to the primary care of at least one ill or physically disabled individual. So that's a, uh, a new, change, relatively recent change to uh, the education and election law. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the application deadlines uh, are very uh, seven days if the ballot's to be mailed, one day if the voter is to pick up the absentee ballot. Okay, moving on to improper advocacy. I uh, just want to touch on this, uh, this issue again about uh, this is in the lead up to the election. We all know that uh, various groups, uh, especially today where there's so much, there's such a premium on making sure uh, budget votes uh, are passed uh, rather, uh, you know, with majorities, uh, or in case, if you are a district that you're going to be going out for 60% uh, vote because you want to override the cap and you really want to drum up the support, um, 
if you go, if the district is going to allow its facilities to be used in any which uh, in, in some way, or it's going to be um, publishing newsletters in support uh, or it, to uh, newspapers related to the budget, uh, they need to be factual. Uh, they they cannot say uh, under New York law that uh, vote yes. You can't say that. So I gave you a couple examples here. Um, if we had a, a newsletter that said that this capital project would result in a 50% reduction in energy cost to the district, um, that language is fine if, if that if those are what if they if those are what the facts are. Um, a flyer compare that to a flyer that says voting yes, make, because you're going to make our students and our teachers happier. Uh, that flyer would, would not pass muster with the Commissioner of Education because it is advocating for a specific position uh, which is in support of the, of the budget. Co Commissioner has uh, also issued a couple other decisions as well and these address the, you know, the, what we call targeting selected lists of voters. So for example, um, if you are a district that sends out a pre-recorded vote reminder, but the message only goes out to parents of students in your district, uh, that according to the commissioner is no good because you are, all, you are targeting a select portion of the qualified voters in your district, just parents. Not everybody in the district has kids in the school, kids in school so uh, pre-recorded votes just select, targeted to parents, not good. Uh, one district uh, also thought they would be uh, very uh, innovative. So, and one day they had uh, actually said, "All right, um, if you kids uh, get your parents to come and vote and bring in their coupon, you're going to get a free day of uh, a free homework pass or a free book." Uh, very innovative. Yes, does not uh, did not. Uh, the commissioner was not particularly uh, satisfied with with that innovation, and he said that that again was targeting that benefit, if you will, was targeting only a selected group of voters in the district, namely the parents of those elementary school students. And uh, lastly, I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention this, and I don't know how many. Or of you or who are participating have le are still using the lever voting machines. Um, you are still allowed to use lever voting machines uh, in the current up in the upcoming election. Uh, whether that will be extended once again, and there is proposed legislation uh, which would extend the exception uh, again uh, out for another year, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, I think at some point. Uh, the school districts are going to be forced to go to the Scantron option uh, be, because the uh, equipment vendors uh, making parts for these lever voting machines are non-existent. And so uh, if your machine is not operable and you, dis and, you ha and you use it for a vote, that could create significant problems if it malfunctions as uh, we will detail a little bit more in later in the presentation. But for now I'm going to turn over uh, this part of the presentation as we've, we've moved on from pre-vote worries to election day conundrums. So take it away, Allison. All right, so in this section we're going to talk about uh, appointing election inspectors, poll watchers. We're going to discuss um, affidavit ballots versus declaration ballots. In addition, we are going to talk about um, events that will be held at the district during the election and electioneering. Um, so first, with regard to election inspectors, there must be, in non-city school districts, you need at least two inspectors per machine. So if you're a union-free or essential school district, the school board is the one who appoints the inspectors, and they also employ, appoint any assistant inspectors that they'd like to have. And in addition, the school board needs to designate a chief election inspector. Now, it's slightly different procedure in small city school districts. There, the school board appoints 
three inspectors for each election district and can appoint additional inspectors as needed. And the inspectors actually elect their own chairperson. And if the chairperson wants, they can appoint an assistant poll clerk to help them out. Students are permitted to be election inspectors if they like. Um, their qualifications, they must be 17 years old. They need to have consent of the school district and their parents. They cannot be absent from school. Um, but the law doesn't really say anything whether they're required to go through the same any training requirements. You know, the County Board of Elections, they usually train um, election inspectors. Um, and they are entitled to payment the same way that other election inspectors are um, paid. Now, um, in terms of poll watchers, if you are a district with personal registration, the law clearly states that any school board candidate can designate a poll watcher. Now, we've had some districts that like to have kind of a poll watcher certification that they sign off just saying, like, I have been asked by blank candidate to be a poll watcher uh, during this election. And it's just good for the district to have kind of a, a list of everybody who was there and who they were there on behalf of. And it can come in handy if the election is um, challenged down the road. If you are a district without personal registration, this statute doesn't give any explicit authority to designate poll watchers. However, um, there's nothing that prevents any qualified voter, at, whether you're in a central school district, a union-free school district, or someone without or with personal registration. A qualified voter has the right to be present at the polling place and exercise his or her right to challenge any of the qualifications of the voters that are presenting themselves to vote. Um, now, that person has the right to be there, but they cannot interfere with the election or engage in electioneering. Moving on to um, affidavit ballots, if you are a district with personal registration, you're going to deal with affidavit ballots, whereas if you have no personal registration, you're going to be dealing with declaration ballots. So in a district with personal registration, um, if a person shows up and they're not on the poll list, they, what they need to do is complete the affidavit ballot by which they swear that they're duly registered to vote, that there must be a mistake, that they should be on the list, but for some reason they're not on the list, or that their name was incorrectly omitted from the list. They're going to then sign the affidavit ballot, which should be printed on an envelope. Then the election inspector should give that person a paper ballot. The person should a paper ballot and the paper ballot should be placed in the envelope, sealed, and we'll return it to the board with the other records of the election, and they're going to canvas that later on in the night. That person does not vote on the machine. Slightly different in a district without personal registration. So there, if somebody comes in um, and they're not on the, on the list, or they say um, if somebody challenges that voter as not being qualified to vote, then the chairman needs to require that the person make a declaration. And you can see here on the screen there's different declaration, whether in union-free central school districts or a small city school district. So the person would um, make that declaration, they would sign it, and then you have to permit them to vote on the machine. So there's no paper ballot issued in this if you are a district without personal registration. That person should be voting right on the Weaver machine or the scanner machine. Um, now, a lot of districts like to hold events uh, on the election day, whether it be a concert or the PTA might hold a bake sale or the district might hold um, an art show, an exhibit, something like that. That alone is not improper, but similar to um, the improper advocacy rules that we talked about previously, um, the district has to give notice to, of the event to all district residents in the same manner and not just to those residents, for example, the parents who the board thinks that is going to vote for the budget. So for example, if you're going to hold, a, um, let's say, a concert on that day, you want to put it in the district calendar. You want to send out a notice to all residents. You, maybe you put up flyers in the, um, in the grocery stores, as opposed to just sending home a flyer about the concert in school backpacks. Um, the commissioner may find that just sending it home to the backpacks is targeting parents who are most likely to vote yes, and that is improper. Um, in addition, um, actually, I want to talk quickly about um, ele okay, electioneering, um, which means electioneering. Oh. 
This comes from Sarah. She wants to know what happens if the person who signs a declaration is determined to not be a qualified voter and they did in fact vote on the lever machine. What would happen, uh, is the question what would happen to the, their vote? Uh, the question is what happens if, let me, let me just reread it here. What happens if the person who signs a declaration is determined not to be a qualified voter and they did in fact vote on the lever machine? So what happens, they are when, I guess? What happens, uh, well, there is actually a provision uh, in the uh, New York State education law which authorizes a school superintendent uh, to prosecute an action against that individual to recover ten dollars. Uh, believe it or not, that, that I don't think I'm not aware of any cases uh, that in which that has been enforced. I mean, arguably that's a fraud, and the matter could be referred out to uh, local law enforcement. But I would, it, I'm not sure it would be. A, local law enforcement and, and a district attorney would be willing to prosecute someone for that. Uh, so I think those are really the, those are the, the remedies or, or the consequences of an individual who votes but is determined not to, ultimately determined not to be a, a qualified voter. As for recording their vote, uh, I guess it would, if, if, again, if their vote is challenged uh, and then their uh, well, they would have already recorded on the lever machine, so that would already have been recorded. So that's not going to result in setting aside a vote uh, unless uh, there were so many people like that and the election results were so close. So, for example, a person had won. Let's say a person had was declared the winner and they won by one vote. And it turns out that in the election there were multiple individuals who were determined not to be qualified voters and who cast their votes, uh, and it's more than one, then the election could be set aside. But if it's just one individual voting who is determined not to be a qualified voter and it doesn't set aside, and it's not enough to turn the election results aside, then the election results will remain as is. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are talking about electioneering, uh, which means advocating for a position or for a candidate. It is not permitted within a 100-foot zone uh, measured from the entrance of the polling place on the day of the election. The election inspector should be actually posting physical distance markers to delineate the 100 feet. Now, um, examples of electioneering could be distributing campaign materials or asking somebody to vote for you if you're a candidate or you know anybody asking somebody to vote for somebody else um, they can't the district could post factual information within 100 feet if they wanted so for example if the district wants to put up a poster of pictures of the parts of the school property that will be improved through a capital campaign they might uh, do that but you want to avoid putting any language on there that um, would advocate. So if you have the poster and at the bottom you say, you would make our students happy if you voted yes for the, you know, the additional budget. That would be improper because that itself is electioneering. Um, nothing prohibits uh, conducting exit polls as long as that's not interfering with the voting process. In addition, uh, the press is permitted to be on school property uh, as long as, again, they're not interfering with people coming and going to, uh, to participate in the election. Um, some examples of electioneering, there was a case where students were wearing um, Vote Yes to Save RCS t-shirts. Um, they weren't actually in the polling place per se, they were just walking, you know, they were going throughout their school day. Uh, they tried to argue that that was improper electioneering, but the commissioner said that there was no proof that they were walking within 100 feet of the polling place, <laughs> and um, just because voters might have walked past those students wasn't enough to to show improper electioneering. Um, board candidates who are seen speaking with voters within 100 feet of the property, it's only improper if you can actually prove that they were actually advocating for a position asking people to vote for them. For example, there's a recent case that was uh, found that was held uh, in this past summer that Dan's going to talk about more detail a little bit later. Part of that case was that the board candidate was actually walking people from their cars into the polling place 
And there was proof that within that 100 feet, she had been discussing the election with people and asking them to vote for her. And the commissioner found that that was improper. Um, final uh, example of an electioneering case, the um, school district held a barbecue, or the school yearbook committee actually held a barbecue um, during the election. The vote, the, somebody tried to argue that because the voters could smell the delicious aroma of the chicken uh, while they were voting, that this actually was enticing people to vote in a certain way and that that was improper. Um, the commissioner found that because the grill was outside of 100 feet of the polling place um, and that the barbecue is properly advertised throughout the district, that just because uh, people could smell the chicken inside the polling place didn't uh, constitute improper electioneering. And lastly, um, just a note that incumbent board members who are running for re-election should not serve as chairpeople during the annual meeting. All right, just moving on to uh, post-vote quandaries, a uh, little bit about canvassing machine votes, how you certify the result, what happens in, with discrepancies in vote counts, who gets to see notes of office. Um, in canvassing vote, votes, uh, kind of a simple rule, tabulate machine votes first, absentee ballots second. Uh, those ba ballots are counted by election inspectors, and then the chairperson declares the result of each ballot as announced by the election inspectors. It's the district clerk's responsibility and sole responsibility to record the result of, of, of the vote. Um, as far on, uh, about canvassing, uh, and these are really the uh, what happens if you have you know with the, with the paper t paper ballots uh, that you number one uh, if you deface or, or, or tear a ballot or make an erasure uh, under the yes is it necessary for the school attorney to oversee the vote tally uh, no it's not over not essential for the school attorney to oversee the vote tally. Uh, moving on with that, uh, on, on, on canvassing, um, I think the, the key issue you, what I would, uh, that you have to remember here, as long as you can ascertain the intent of a voter, uh, you need to count the vote. And that was, uh, and that, that was important in this case called Appeal of Gresty, which is mentioned here, uh, where the board invalidated several ballots because the voter uh, actually wrote in the name of a candidate but didn't mark a specific X or a check mark in the adjacent box. So just because they didn't have an X, uh, the board was, was very, very strictly said, well, you didn't comply with the voting requirement. Uh, commissioner said that writing the name of a candidate is sufficient to indicate a vote. I mean, it's very clear to ascertain who, what the uh, voter's intent was, and there's no requirement that a voter must place a mark in an adjacent box. As far as um, absentee ballots, um, they're counted after the closing of the polls. Again, the, in order for an absentee ballot to be counted, it has to have been received in the district by 5 p.m. Uh, by the district clerk. Um, the ballots themselves need to be opened in public. Uh, so that qual and the reason for that is so voters can present objections. Uh, does that mean that the votes have to be right in the you know placed on a table where all the candidates and other voters are hovering around? No, but th at the same time they can't be in the back room counting the absentee ballots. There needs to be uh, they need to be opened where at least the proceedings are being visualized. Uh, Ballots received after five aren't counted, as I mentioned, uh, they're, in, they're invalid. Um, and if the, what happens if the ballot envelope, for example, has a has missing date or an inaccurate date, does that mean you void it? No, you, you don't void it. And I think, again, that goes to uh, ascertaining the intent of the voter. That's really the, the, the critical issue. But what happens if you uh, challenge, uh, how, do you, how does someone challenge an absentee ballot? Uh, in your legal notice, uh, you are required to post your list of absentee uh, voters, whoever gets the absentee ballots. And the reason for that, and that list has to be posted at uh, 
in, in, in a public place on the date of the election, either before or after the election. If it's before the election, Someone could examine the absentee uh, list and they say, well, I know this, uh, this person, you know, he claims that he's out and uh, he's down. He's extended his, uh, his month vacation uh, in the Caribbean, but I know he's back. I've seen him back in town uh, and I know he's going to be presenting themselves to vote, so I'm going to, you know, write a challenge. Um, written challenges have to be transmitted by the clerk to the election inspectors so that they have them so that if this would be a, a voter who got an absentee ballot and, pro and may have sent it in, if he happens to show up at the polling site and tries to vote, then that individual uh, can be challenged. Um, absentee ballots cannot be challenged, however, after the election. So if someone discovers uh, that someone was not telling the truth uh, when they got their absentee ballot and they were in town uh, too late after the election. It has to be, the absentee ballots have to be challenged uh, on or, or before the, the election occurs. Um, if the signatures on the ballot and the register do not match or the envelope contains no signature or the person's name not on the register, what, do, what are you supposed to do? Or the person who signed the envelope happened to vote in person, what do you do? As an election inspector, that uh, those envelopes have to be returned unopened to you as the district clerk. Uh, so Allison mentioned before this recent case uh, out of uh, Hempstead uh, on Long Island, uh, appeal of Torre, uh, and in that case uh, there were many, uh, there were a number of irregularities that were claimed, but the one that the commissioner found to be most uh, uh, most fraudulent is that uh, failing to maintain a list of uh, persons receiving absentee ballots is an open invitation to fraud and it threatens the integrity of the electoral process. So that's why it's critical that, that you have this list of absentee uh, of those individuals who have received absentee ballots. And in that case the commissioner annulled the results of the vote and ordered a revote. Counting absentee ballot uh, affidavit ballots, and I ha so I didn't mention uh, this earlier because we said we count machine first and then we count uh, absentee ballots. But what about the paper ballots for people who present themselves and not, are not on the list, but you know they they sign the affidavit and are given the paper ballot? Um, the under the education law, each affidavit ballot must be considered at a meeting called no more than ten days after the election. Uh, does that mean it could be uh, one day after the election? Sure. Could it be five days after the election? Sure. And the idea here is that if someone took the time to present themselves to vote and cast a vote, it needs to be counted. Question for you. Uh, yes. How can you deny a person the right to vote if the signature doesn't match? What if they had a stroke or other debil de excuse me, debilitating illness? So what if they if they had a a, a debilitating uh, a stroke or, or disability? Um, they're probably I would that probably is a uh, is a ground if you could establish that the the ballot that the person who has the absentee ballot has a physical disability, uh, and you could compare compare their signatures. I'm not sure. I suppose that would be a, a qualified exemption to that rule, but I'm not sure how you're going to be able to present that uh, unless there's some other evidence that 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 you could show uh, that's submitted when you get your absentee ballot that if if they if they uh, have a disability that prevents them from from signing uh, the list. I, I would say that if the individual is, has that kind of a disability, they, they may qualify for permanent disability, in which case, you know, if, if they're... Hello? Yes, we have. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, I was, what I, what, I, what I was going to say is that if the, if the individual who has a physical disability uh, can't sign it, uh, they're probably going to get the absentee ballot as a member as, as marked permanently disabled. So I would think that that ballot would have to be counted. 
moving on to affidavit, uh, as far as the counting of the ballots, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have you could have this meeting. You're supposed to count the affidavit ballots. The meeting has to be take place within 10 days after the election. Um, as a district clerk, you must send notice five days prior to the meeting to each candidate entitled to have watchers or challengers present at the polls. Um, that's a, a requirement under education law. And again, at the meeting, each affidavit ballot must be considered. Any ballot that's not sealed in the envelope must be rejected. Any ballot for whom there is no registration poll record or central registration record in the Board of Elections office must be rejected. Um, and once you canvass all the votes, you add that to the previous tally of all votes and, and that becomes the, to that would be your total number and that's the number that should be certified. Any lawful, any person can come and present an objection to the ballot not be, being counted. Uh, the inspectors have to make the determination and the inspectors must notify one, not and you as a district clerk must notify anybody whose affidavit ballot was rejected along with the reason for the rejection and the appropriate time to register or re-register. And if you are a district with personal registration, you must enclose an application to re-register. Certification of results, uh, it's the Board of Education's responsibility to do that. Um, if you have personal registration, certification should not take place until the affidavit ballots have been canvassed. If, it's, if you're a district without personal registration, uh, that could be done as soon as all the uh, machine and the absentee ballots are canvassed and tabulated. A little bit quickly about discrepancies. Uh, Commissioner, any election dispute under the, uh, must be referred to Commissioner of Education. Uh, and there are those districts where voting machines uh, malfunction and the results are not, are not properly tabulated that the commissioner has annulled the election results. So that's more the warning for districts with who are still using lever machines that if those lever machines stop working, the longer you go beyond uh, you go beyond the deadline uh, of when you should be going to Scantron, uh, the greater the opportunity for malfunctioning machines because there are no vendors who are making replacement parts anymore for these for the lever machines. Uh, if a uh, if there's a discrepancy uh, that's discovered, but it's not large enough to affect the result of the election. Uh, what what happens? Is there a revote? In one case, uh, no, there would not be a revote. There could be a recount, but not a revote because the discrepancy is not large. And that's really the important thing to remember. Uh, if the, if the, the, the discrepancy, it's not enough that the procedures weren't followed. It has to be that the discrepancies were, discrepancies were large enough to set aside the vote. It would be a different result. And uh, here's another case. Uh, that I talked that in which the commissioner discusses what happened with the malfunction in the election, and so there was this machine only registered 399 votes, uh, even though there were 408 votes who appeared. The budget vote failed only by five votes, so again the discrepancy was large enough to warrant a revote. And briefly, on uh, I think we're running out of time here. Uh, just a little bit on varied terms. I have a question. Right yes. The end here. Um, how does the Board of Education certify the results? Is it done through a resolution at the next Board of Elections or, or Board of Education meeting? Uh, yes, the Board of Education would, at the next board meeting, uh, adopt a resolution certifying the total number of votes for each proposition and as well as the votes for each uh, candidate and. They should list, uh, there should be a list, it could be like in an Excel spreadsheet that, you know, how many machine ballots, yay or nay for the budget, uh, how many ab absentee ballots, yay or nay for the budget, how many affidavit ballots, yay or nay for the budget, and similarly for the, uh, for the candidates as well. Um, see, we're, we're approaching the time uh, just on varied terms. Uh, 
If there's an unexpired term to fill that is shorter than the regular term, the candidate And we have another number. question for you. Does the uh, Board of Education have to meet the same night as the vote? No. The answer to that is a resounding no. In fact, the education law suggests that uh, they should meet uh, at least 24 hours after. But a, a board could meet, but they're not required to, I think is the way I would answer that. OK. Um, as far as the varied terms, as I was saying, if, uh, if you have an unexpired term that is shorter than the regular term, the candidate with the lowest number of votes that still would make them eligible is elected to that position. Uh, if, if the district clerk must provide written notice to that individual elected, and the term begins that night. So they, that individual, of course, would need to have their oath of office if they have determined to be elected. It has to be administered, uh, or they need to file it within 30 days of the election. And if a current board member is elected to fill a vacancy, they must resign from their position and file a new oath of office to fill the vacancy to which they were elected. Uh, the saving grace, again, is uh, the commission. It's a very, very high bar to set aside an election. You must show not only that there are irregularities, but that the irregularities that were shown affected the outcome of the vote. And this question, uh, can someone request to re-canvas voting machines if they have a complaint uh, that they are not satisfied with the process? There is nothing in the education law that authorizes re-canvassing of, of school votes. The law only requires that once they're canvassed, the ballot boxes be sealed and opened upon order of the commissioner. So the individual wants if the individual is complaining about processes and procedures that they feel are not consistent with the law, their remedy is to file an application with the commissioner to uh, challenge the election. They cannot request a re-canvas. And lastly, uh, if, you know, I... This is uh, just probably a good guide for district clerks. There's a, a good do document on New York State Education Department's website, and I provide you with the, uh, the URL for that, uh, which just gives you some additional information that I think would be helpful in uh, running a school district election and from the pre-vote uh, requirements through the actual running of the election and what to worry about for, uh, after the election. So. I think with that, uh, we are concluded. I uh, don't know if there are any other questions, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, Allison and I appreciate uh, your time this afternoon. Yeah, we have a, all right, a very big question here. <laughs> all right, here we go. The right, board or its designee could be district clerk has to consider each affidavit ballot at a meeting called no more than 10 days after the election. Five days prior to the meeting, notice must be sent by first class mail to each candidate entitled to have watchers or challengers present at the polls. If you use the county voter registration list, who would be at the meeting? Can you notify candidates five, before, five days before the election that if you have an affidavit ballot, they would be considered the... Oh, geez. Can you notify candidates five days before the election that if you have affidavit ballots, they would be considered the day and after the elections? So uh, I think the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, the, the district clerk could, um, five days prior to the meeting, to consider affidavit ballots, and that could be five. They could decide. They, they, that meeting could actually take place at the conclusion of the vote that evening. Um, uh, district clerk could say to all the candidates that we're going to be holding a meeting following the election uh, to consider any affidavit ballots. Uh, and you have the right to have your watchers or challenge, challenges uh, present at the poll. So that, that, could, that is something that would comply with uh, the education law. All right, and next question, how long must you keep the ballot boxes? 
how much must you, well, ballots, uh, I believe under New York State education law, uh, the results of the election are permanent. Um, the ballots themselves, uh, or the, was it the question the boxes or the, or the ballots themselves? The question says ballot boxes. I believe it's six months, but uh, what I will do is, uh, what I can do is in a confirming email with, uh, with yourself, and you could uh, share that with the participants in the meeting. I, I'll, I'll send something out. Just uh, she just updated her question. Um, with the ballots in them, how long the must you keep the ballot boxes with the ballots in them? Uh, well, it, it's a minimum of six months. Uh, and it may be longer if the election is challenged, uh, but I'm going to uh, specifically confirm that. Uh, I need to just to, to verify an item with the uh, with the records retention schedule that the state uh, education department uh, has uh, concerning that item. And I'll send a follow-up email to you uh, so you could share with the uh, with all the uh, participants in the meeting. Thank you very much. That is the final question. Do you have any uh, parting words, Daniel? Um, good luck uh, to all of you, uh, and may uh, the spring weather come ever so soon. <laughs> I think we all agree. All right, everyone, thank you very much for attending. If anyone has questions after the fact, feel free to email me. Again, my name is Matthew Darius. You can find my email on our website under staff. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you.